We are all under a double sentence of death. Because of our sin, we are under the sentence of physical death, but also because of our sin, we are under the sentence of eternal death, which is absolute, complete, eternal separation from Almighty God. Our world, if you hadn't noticed, seems to be obsessed with death. Everywhere you look, um, you see pictures of skulls, you see them on the backs of uh, vans and so forth, and cars, you see them on drink uh, containers, you see um, everywhere you go. It, it, it seems like there are constant reminders of death. And while it is certainly true that that is sort of the end for all of us in this world, um, to, to glorify that and to focus on that is an unhealthy sort of a situation. There are a couple ways in which we do that. One is through fantasy. You know, Halloween is one of those things that we glorify uh, death. We think about ghouls and ghosts and goblins and Satan and anything to do with death itself or with the horrific experience of people after death. Uh, we all instinctively understand that there's more to life than just what happens in this world, and so we, we glorify those things, uh, particularly at Halloween, but other times. One of those times is known as the Day of the Dead. It started out as a primarily a, a Mexican or Mesoamerican celebration, Central America there, and it was a belief that on a particular night, um, children who had died would come back and visit with their families, and on the next night, uh, adults who had died would come back and visit with their families. There was kind of a, a crossing over between the dead and the living. Uh, that grew and expanded, and now it's not just a one-day celebration, but anywhere from about October the 28th all the way to as late as November 6th, depending on the part of the world that you're in, uh, there might be a Day of the Dead celebration. And they set food out, and uh, it's, it's all kinds of activities, uh, mostly in costume, faces all painted and so forth to look like they're dead. That seems like a strange thing to celebrate, doesn't it? Um, if you've ever been to a funeral home for a funeral, you know death is not something you celebrate. It's something you grieve. It's something you mourn. But we've turned it into a fantasy kind of thing. Uh, and then, of course, there's zombies. You know, that's a big thing in our world today. Uh, the undead. Where do these zombies come from? Well, they're a dead body that's supposedly been reanimated in some way by voodoo or magic or some other kinds of mystical powers. And, and the, the result is something that's neither dead nor alive. It's sort of in this in-between state. Well, there is no in-between state according to Scripture. You're either, you're either dead or you're living. One of the two. But we, we, we fantasize about this stuff. And young people fantasize about it. You go to school and you can see them doodling on their papers and, and they've got these ghoulish doodles going on and, and it fills up the online games and death is just a, a part of that whole gaming experience where you are in some cavern or some uh, maze, labyrinth, beneath, beneath a castle maybe, and, and you're killing these demons and these ghoulish creatures, and that's just what's filling the minds of people today. That's the fantasy side of it. But then there is the actuality of it, the actual side of things. For example, abortion. That is the killing 
of a child in the womb. It, 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 that's all that it is. It's murder. And we claim that as a right. It's interesting to read the laws of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania on murder, and it talks about all kinds of things that happen in this condition and that condition and so forth. But then they fall all over themselves stating that abortion is not murder. It's like, seriously? So the taking of life here is murder, but the taking of life purposely here is not murder. How do we... And it's... It makes no sense. And then there's the whole dying with dignity kind of thing. In fact, there's an organization called Dying with Dignity that is probably the largest advocate for assisted suicide. That if life gets too difficult, if the pain gets too great, if the outcome of the disease is, is going to be death, well, you can kill yourself. Wait a minute. If the outcome of disease is going to be death, you can go ahead and kill yourself. That seems odd, doesn't it? It does to me. Now, I understand some of their concerns are for the amount of pain and suffering that a person might endure, but Scripture seems to indicate that even those things, the pain and suffering that we might endure, have value in God's economy. They're not without purpose. They're not without some kind of ultimate benefit to us. Maybe they suffering seems in the pages of Scripture seems to sort of strip away our fantasies about what life is and helps us to come to the reality of what life really is and that this life is short, this life is a vapor, this life is filled with sin and sorrow and agony, and that's exactly why Jesus came to deliver us from the consequences even of our own sin. And so maybe there is value in that kind of suffering. There's the Hemlock Society, although they reorganized in 2003, that's what I first remember hearing them as, the Hemlock Society. They were kind of the premier group, or the, at least the ones that got all the attention in the early days of the euthanasia and assisted suicide movement. But now, in 2003, they reorganized, and they have a much nicer name. It's called Compassion and Choices Society. Compassion and Choices. Then there's, of course, Dignitas, which is based in Switzerland, and they have a tremendous online presence. And anywhere from ten dollars to $20,000, you can go to Switzerland and connect with this group, and you can end your life. You think I'm making this up, don't you? <laughs> there's Dying with Dignity in Canada. There's the Final Exit Network which was kind of grew up out of a book called Final Exit. Uh, I think it was Derek Humphreys that, uh, that wrote that. Beloved, this world in both the fantasy aspect of life and the reality, the actuality of life, is obsessed with death. We feel like we, we want to control it. We want to manipulate it. It's just amazing at how these organizations function. Why, why is there this intense interest, this morbid fascination? Well, I think it's the consequence of our fallenness as human beings. We are all under a double sentence of death. Because of our sin, we are under the sentence of physical death. These bodies do not last forever. But also, because of our sin, we are under the sentence of eternal death, what the Bible calls the second death, which is absolute, complete, eternal separation from Almighty God, suffering because of our sin. So, if that is true, then how can the unbelieving human 
being cope with that? Well, we can fantasize about it. We can turn it into something that, that might be fun. So you see all these little skeletons painted up in bright colors dancing about. Doesn't that soften the, the picture of death a little bit? If, if, it's a, if it's like a party, then it must not be too terribly bad. Or we try to control it and, and think we're making death our servant. If we have to face death, we're going to do it on our terms. We're going to determine the moment of our death. We're going to determine the manner of our death. We're going to control death. If we have to face it, we're going to control it for ourselves. And all of those are simply futile human efforts at dealing with something that is the consequence of our sin. It's the consequence, it's the outpouring of the judgment of God against sin. And that's not something that you and I can control or manipulate or explain away. God is the source of life. Look with me at Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. God is the source of life. How, I mean, yes, death is going to come to every one of us. But how should we look at that event? How should we look at death itself? Well, first of all, we need to be reminded of the truth that is right here in the beginning of Scripture, right here at the beginning of creation, that God is the source, the author of life. Genesis chapter 2, verse 7 says this, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. This is different from how God created the animals. He created the animals from the dust of the earth and He gave them life. But here, God is intimately involved in that. He imparts His breath into man. The word there is ruach. It's also translated as spirit. There is something different about us. We are created in God's image. We are His image bearers. That is not true of any other aspect of the created universe. It's not true of angels. It's not true of animals. It's not true of the physical universe. Human beings themselves alone are image bearers of their Creator. And God breathed into man that breath of life and that is when Adam became a living soul, able to respond to his Creator, <coughs> to know his Creator, to have a relationship with his Creator, something that was unique in all of creation. God is the author of life. So that begs the question, doesn't it? If God is the author of life, how did death get here? Why do we have to deal with death now? Well, if we would keep reading in Genesis, which we don't have time to do today, but you do this afternoon, you will discover when you get to Genesis chapter 3 that Adam and Eve, that man into whom God breathed that first breath of life, rebelled against his Creator. He did not obey the one command that God gave to not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God said, don't do that because in the day that you do it, you will die. And it's an interesting way that it's expressed there. It, it's kind of like this in English. Dying, you will die and continue to die until you're dead. Which is why Adam didn't drop over the moment he ate whatever that fruit was, we kind of call it an apple, but it just simply says a fruit. He didn't immediately physically drop into a hole in the ground then, did he? No, in fact, Scripture says he lived 930 years and he had sons and daughters. 
but he died spiritually. There was that separation from himself apart from God. God eventually, after pronouncing some judgments, drove him out of the Garden of Paradise and put a, 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 an angel there with a flaming sword to prevent man's return. There was a spiritual death, but the process of death, of physical death, began in Adam and it resulted 930 years later in Adam dropping into a hole in the ground. Doesn't take us that long, does it? We get 60, 70, 80 years. The moment you're conceived, the process of death has already started. By the time you're 18, your body is producing fewer and fewer cells to replace the cells that are dying. And so, even at what seems like the very height of of our physical strength and ability, those early or late teen, early 20 years, we're already dying. And it's because Adam and all of us have rebelled against God. Death is God's judgment against sin. He's the source of life, and He is the source of of new life. And we're going to talk about that. Because that is our hope. That He is the source of life and He is the source of new life. A animal life, th this world is so distorted in its perspective on things. Some of you may remember the, the founder of PETA. P-E-T-A, people eating tasty, no, it's uh, people, for the, people for the ethical treatment of animals. Her name was Ingrid Newkirk. And she was, she's probably most well known for, for this quote, that a rat is a pig, is a dog, is a boy. In other words, there's no difference between a rat and a pig and a dog and a boy. They're all animals and they all have rights. We shouldn't have lab rats because they have rights. We shouldn't eat pigs because they have rights. We shouldn't abuse dogs because they have rights. And, well, let's see, I guess... No, a boy's just an animal, so we don't need to preserve it. We don't need to protect it. It's just an animal. Do you see the disconnect? We get all excited about lab rats, and we abort babies like crazy. We get all excited about pigs having a nice place in which to live, and chickens that are free range, and all those things, but, but we don't care about human life. That's not the way God looks at it. The animals, yes, they have a, a quality of life, but it's vastly different from what we have. And Scripture says that the righteous man is concerned for the welfare of his animal. And, and, and we should not abuse the animals. I mean, they are put here for our benefit. They are put here as a food source. They are put here for our enjoyment. You know, I, I enjoy having Jasmine run around and play in the house, and uh, I don't get real excited when she wants to go out when it's minus two outside, but, you know, she brings a lot of enjoyment to our home. And you don't mistreat those animals, but you also recognize that there is a huge qualitative difference between a human being and an animal. And this world wants to equate them. Why? Because this world says we're all here by chance. This world says that we've all just evolved differently. And so man is just a higher form of ape. And the ape is just a branch off the, 
the pig tree or the rat tree or whatever. And, and, and it's just all a genetic accident that we're here. And, and so it really doesn't matter. There's no moral or ethical issues involved. It's just by chance. And if the dice rolled in your favor, go with it. But that's not what Scripture says. In fact, God has enshrined the value of human life in the Ten Commandments. Ah, I, I'm sorry, I skipped over Genesis chapter 9. Let's back up and take a look at Genesis chapter 9. This, of course, is after the flood. God brought judgment on the world because the world has own, every thought and intent of the heart of man was only evil continuously. Genesis chapter 6, and God brought judgment on that and saved Noah and his family and through them kind of restarted humanity. But sin bridged that flood barrier because Noah and his wife and his sons and their wives, they were not perfect individuals. They were not sinless individuals. And so as soon as the flood was over and Shem, Ham, and Japheth began having kids with their wives, guess what? Those kids were born sinners because the flood wasn't designed to solve that problem. It dealt with the problem, but it wasn't designed to solve the problem. That's going to come later through Jesus Christ. But God, after the flood, makes it very clear that human life is something to be preserved and protected. Look with me at chapter 9, verse 5. Surely for your lifeblood, he's speaking to Noah, God is, I will demand a reckoning. From the hand of every beast I will require it. And from the hand of man, from the hand of every man's brother, I will require the life of man. Whoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed. For in the image of God he made man. No murdering. You know, and, and if a beast kills a man, that beast suffers death. How important is man to kill a man is what we call a capital crime. It is a crime that is worthy of death. The murderer should not live. You say, Pastor Roger, now wait a minute. Uh, let's find a loophole. That's Old Testament. That's not New Testament. No. Paul recognized the state's authority to put him to death. Didn't he? Paul says, if I've done something worthy of death, I don't, I don't uh, refuse to die. But if not, and of course he hadn't, the death penalty is a powerful penalty, isn't it? And it's a powerful penalty because life itself is so precious and should not be assaulted that is the to to murder someone is the ultimate striking out at god because we're created in god's image and god takes that seriously he takes that very very seriously he enshrines the value of human life in the ten commandments there in exodus chapter 20 the first five commandments are our responsibility toward God. The second five are our responsibility toward one another. And the very first one in that second list, number six, is you shall not murder. And in the Hebrew Bible, it is a specific word. It's not the generic word for kill. It is the specific word murder. You shall not purposely take the life of of another. That's how important it is. God is a God of life. Death is a judgment from God. It's a judgment against sin. 
It's a responsibility. Well, even in our own Declaration of Independence, we recognize that life is one of those things that should be preserved and protected. Let me just, I think I included it in your notes, but let me just read it. Second paragraph says, We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights. To be endowed by your Creator means that the government has nothing to do with it. This comes from God. It doesn't come from any other source. This comes from God. We are endowed by our Creator with unalienable rights. These are rights that cannot be taken from you. That among these are, what's that first one? Life. Life. Liberty. And the pursuit of happiness. That to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men. That's Genesis chapter 9. You know, where the, the nations, the, the foundation of nations is established and, and the thing that they're to, to care for is life and the, the murderer is not to continue. Now they go on to say in our declaration that says the governments are instituted among men deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. I would take exception to that particular sentence. I think it probably should say deriving their just powers from Almighty God through His Word? Because if governments derive their just powers through the consent of the populace, the populace might not come up with a good idea. If it's simply by majority vote, the majority might be wrong, right? Yeah. Yeah. There needs to be a higher standard than the majority. That higher standard needs to be God. But we at least understood in our fallen imperfect way, there are some things that God has established that human beings don't mess with. And one of those is life. The responsibility of human government is to preserve and to protect and to promote life. That's why you don't allow a murderer to continue. Because they, they are completely antithetical to everything that involves life. And yes, it's a serious, serious penalty, but it's one that God instituted. To preserve. The word preserve means to keep or to maintain intact. So if government is to preserve life, how do we do that? Well, through laws and policies which sustain life and ensure its continuance until natural death. Natural death, not controlled, manipulated, death with dignity kind of death. What an oxymoron. That's, that's what government should be doing, is to promote life. To protect. The word protect means to cover or to shield from exposure, injury, damage, or destruction. How can our government protect life? Well, through laws or actions which prevent violence towards other persons. At all stages of life, whether in the womb or in the nursing home. Abortion laws, well, Roe v. Wade was overturned, wasn't it? And we, we can rejoice in that. The federal judiciary finally had enough sense to say this is wrong. But they didn't go far enough. Just like the founders of our country in the Declaration of Independence got part of it right, but didn't quite get the whole thing right, so the Supreme Court got part of it right, but didn't quite get the whole thing right because they simply turned it back to the states. And as soon as Roe v. Wade was overturned, you had numerous states just screaming out that, 
Oh, they were going to be safe sanctuaries for anybody that wanted an abortion. You come to us and we'll... Well, because this is a right. So every state has to deal with it, including Pennsylvania. It is the responsibility of human government to preserve and to protect life, and Pennsylvania is not doing that. They are failing in their God-given mandate. Now, we as citizens need to encourage our state representatives to do the right thing. To do the thing. We're, we're not asking the state to, to turn into a church. We're not asking for that, but we are asking the state to do what God says the state ought to do. And that is to preserve and protect life. Get rid of those laws that promote abortion. Get rid of those laws that promote euthanasia. Get rid of those laws that promote assisted suicide. But not only that, it's not enough to point out an evil. We need to do something about it. Promote those laws and policies which advance adoption, which advance quality health care at the end of life. Reach out with compassion. I, you, you, know, you know why the Hemlock Society chose the new name and part of it was compassion? Because they're playing on our turf. We ought to be the most compassionate people in the world. We've received incredible mercy from Almighty God. That compassion that God has exercised toward us, we should exercise toward a lost and dying world. Okay, so there's an unwanted pregnancy. Is abortion the solution to that problem? No. Come alongside that couple. And by the way, it's never just the woman. We know that. Come alongside that couple. Maybe they can't, and maybe they shouldn't get married. Maybe they, they're of the, the, the temperaments that they just never exist together. I don't know. But, but come alongside them with compassion and with alternatives and, and offer adoption so that life can be preserved. That's the calling that we have. One other thing, to promote life. To promote means to contribute to the growth or the prosperity of something. To advance it in station or rank or honor. What can we do to promote life? Well, I think one thing we can do is stop tearing the family apart. Because it's in the family that life begins, right? We should, we should promote those kinds of policies that, that advance the family, that make it easy for a family to function, that make it possible for a mom to fulfill that greatest calling that God has ever placed upon her to be fruitful and multiply, to nurture those children, to be able to train them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. You know, you can't deny it. When this nation was predominantly a nuclear family nation with mom and dad, it was a strong nation. It really was. Was every family perfect? No. Did divorces happen? Yes. Did abuse happen? Yes, it happened. But not on the scale that you see it today. When churches stood up and promoted the strong family unit, when our nation understood that the strong family unit was the foundation of a stable society, we were a stable society. But ever since the family has been split apart and broken up, we have become an unstable nation. It was all done in the name of progressivism, wasn't it? 
It was all done in the name of greater liberty. Oh, we don't want you know these oppressed people, these oppressed women. Some of the most creative women I know were ones that stayed at home and cared for their family and did amazing things and honored God in doing it. But we've abandoned it, haven't we? So the idea of a sanctity of life Sunday, the idea of sanctity of life goes way beyond just overturning Roe versus Wade. It's something that that extends to every single aspect of life. There is an ongoing fight for human life and dignity. The predominant view in the world is that there's too many mouths to feed. I mean, we've got 8 billion plus people in the world. We've got too many mouths to feed. So the globalists, the, the corporate interests are, how can we turn this to our advantage? How can we control this? Just like death itself, we want to figure out how we can control it so it serves our interest. How can we control the population so that it will serve our interests? Well, we need to thin the population out because we just might not have enough food to go around. It's about 10,000 acres of excellent farmland that's been taken out of service here in Franklin County. Multiply that by the 66 counties in Pennsylvania times the 50 states in the Union. We've got plenty of opportunity to feed the world. Plenty of opportunity. Plenty of resources. But the sinfulness of man is creating this crisis. This is not God's doing. God is allowing that sinful tendency of man to run its course, but please don't blame the coming suffering on God. It's us. It's our sinfulness. It's a tragedy. The fight for life is happening at every level of human society. Too much use of natural resources too much freedom. We have to restrict the freedoms of humanity. And yet we said that liberty is one of those inalienable rights given by God our Creator. But we're going to change that. We're going to limit that. We've seen efforts at that already. And those aren't the end. Because they've completely ruled God out. Humanity says there is no God. We don't need God. We don't want God. There is no God. And we're going to run the thing ourselves. And every time humanity has done that, it has resulted in disaster. That's why God brought the flood in Noah's day. That's why God confounded the languages in the days of Babel. That's why God is bringing small and large judgments into this world today because we refuse to acknowledge that we are responsible moral creatures to our Creator. We want to take things into our own hands. And in doing so, all we are doing is multiplying death. You know, I mentioned that there was hope. And that hope is to be found in Jesus Christ. That hope is to be found in the transforming of our minds according to the Word of God. When, when we come to know Jesus Christ as our Savior, it means that first of all, we recognize our own sinfulness, our own estrangement from God, our own separation. We have to recognize, we have to admit that we're not okay. We have to admit that we have rebelled against our Creator and that that rebellion is of eternal immensity and is worthy of eternal separation from God. And then, 
it involves us humbling ourselves and asking God for His mercy and His grace. Admitting our sin. Asking for forgiveness. And God forgives. And when God forgives us, He transforms us. The Spirit of God comes to dwell within us and begins to work in us and to open our minds so that we can understand not only the Word of God, but we can understand the world through the Word of God, the world that we live in, and we have our minds completely renewed and changed from one worldview that is focused on death to a new worldview that's focused on life. And our behaviors change. We don't, we don't worship at the, the shrine of death anymore. We worship the source of life. Jesus Christ Himself. We don't glorify through games and celebrations and whatever else. We don't glorify that old world that is determined to go the path of destruction. Now, we glorify, we worship our Creator. And our, our music changes and our, our art changes and our activities change and everything about us changes so that we're worshiping the giver of life. You see the difference? Beloved, that's the world that we live in. And we who know Jesus Christ, who are worshiping God who gives life and health and strength, we, we are the odd ones. We are the enemy of the world. Because God is the enemy of the world. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't try, that we shouldn't make efforts to promote life. That doesn't mean that we should just abandon ship and say, well, I'm not going to do anything until Jesus comes. I'm just going to get in my little hole and hide somewhere. No, 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 no. God has called us. He has placed us in this world, as it says in the book of Esther, for such a time as this. We're here for God's purpose. So how do we begin? I mean, it looks almost Im impossible, doesn't it? Well, we start with prayer. We start by beseeching the throne of heaven and asking God for wisdom, asking Him for strength, asking Him to work in the hearts and lives of those who are lost in darkness and to do for them what He has done for us, and that is to bring us out of darkness into the light of Jesus Christ. To take us from the kingdom of Satan and to transform us, to change us, to save us, and make us children of the kingdom of His dear Son, Jesus Christ. This is a spiritual battle, beloved, and it has to be fought with spiritual weapons. And prayer is number one. Do we pray for the culture in which we live? Not that they just get better so that we can live quietly, but so that they might be saved. You know? We, we, we tried just making the culture better years ago with the moral majority. We didn't get anybody saved. And that's why we are the way we are today. It, it's, it's not political. This is not, you know, we're not going to pass a law. We're not going to do that. It happens in human hearts, one heart at a time, as God brings salvation to people. So that's where it has to begin. But it doesn't have to end there. It does require some personal action on our part, doesn't it? You remember James? Uh, we're going to get to read James later on in the year here. But um, in James chapter 1, verse 27, we read this, Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and the orphans 
and the widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. Are we reaching out to people around us who need us, who need to know the truth? Are we keeping ourselves unspotted from the world or are we trying to figure out how we can be a Christian and live so close to the world that we can still have the fun of the world but not yet smell like smoke? You know? No. We keep ourselves unspotted from the world. We, we, we interact. We take the Gospel. We extend compassion. We, we, we try to reach the lost but we don't embrace the philosophies of the world. We keep ourselves unspotted from it. What else can we do? We need to teach the truth to the next generation. They've gone out for King's kids now. But I want you to understand something. This world and its systems are teaching your children and grandchildren 24 hours a day, the world's philosophy. They're doing it through games. They're doing it through video. They're doing it through Netflix. They're doing it through every kind of media that you can possibly think of. It's happening in school curriculums. And sadly enough, it's happening in some church curriculums as well. It's sneaking its way in. And beloved, we have got to teach the truth all the time. Deuteronomy 6 talks about the importance of that family. There's the family. Talking about that family teaching to their children when they rise up, when they sit down, when they come in, when they go out, whatever's going on, you teach, you teach, you teach the truth, the truth all the time. But we haven't been doing that. We've assumed that other institutions are on the same page as us. <laughs> they are not. They are not. And we've got to wake up to that. So those three things, prayer, personal involvement, and teaching the truth, that's how things will change. Will we be able to stop the onslaught of evil? No. Scripture says very clearly that when the Lord returns, He's going to wonder, will He find faith on the earth? Evil men... Scripture tells us are going to grow worse and worse. We, we get that. But we are salt and light. Salt preserves. It's like putting on the brakes. You know, the, the, the truck is going to go downhill, but you can at least apply the brakes and it might not get there quite as fast. And, and, and we're supposed to be light. Light exposes. It shows. It makes things evident. We need to be the salt and light in this world that God wants us to be. And in so doing, we are promoting life. In so doing, we are declaring to the world that God is a God of life. That He is the source of life. Not just of the physical life that we enjoy, not just of the physical universe that we enjoy, but He is the source of eternal life. And that, beloved, is the solution to the problems of this world. Let's pray together. Father, I don't even know where to begin. There's just so much. Lord, our world is spinning. It seems like out of control. And yet, Father, You have given us in Your Word the information that we need, all the, the things that we need for life and godliness. And, and we can live differently. And we can share the truth. And the truth, Lord, still sets people free. Even those today that are in absolute darkness, complete blindness, complete rebellion against You. Father, the truth 
of your word still sets people free today. Help us to live according to your word. Help us to live lives that share Jesus Christ with others all the time. Help us to live lives that that teach and proclaim the truth in all situations. Lord Jesus, we pray that you would have mercy upon us, upon your church for having failed so often to, to be the salt and light that you want us to be. Father, have mercy upon this nation. So many millions are lost in darkness. And Lord, they're, they're just going along oblivious to the truth. Open their eyes, Lord. Help them to, to come to a knowledge of the truth, to know Jesus Christ as their Savior, to be redeemed out of that pit of hell into the glorious kingdom of Jesus Christ. Father, we pray that you would come soon and bring this rebellious, crazy world to its culmination. Oh Lord, how we long for you to be ruling and reigning. But until that day comes, Lord, help us to be engaged in the battle on our knees, interceding, sharing our testimonies, doing what we can to promote life. We ask it in your precious name. Amen.